So good to see all of you here at our Keller campus. Also want to welcome all those that are watching us online. And I want to say to you, if you are still waiting to come back and join us because of health, let you know that we're praying for you and we're here to serve you. But if you're still at home out of habit, we're calling you back to gather with Jesus's family and worship together. Come on. So good to be together and to worship Jesus in whatever mode that we're in. I want you to just put your hands together and welcome all those that are joining us today. If you're new with us, we're just so glad that you joined us to worship with us. We are in an interesting series. I call it more of a journey that we're on. We're looking at a concept from scripture that's from the beginning to the end, and that is this concept of seeds. We're looking what the Bible has to say to us about how we face our challenges, we face our circumstances, how we see God. We're gonna see over the next few weeks that this seeds principle literally is how God brings to us salvation through the person of Jesus Christ, that it's very central to the gospel message, this entire understanding of scripture. And uh, we spent a few weeks introducing and understanding it. And then last week, we kicked off the journey. And I want you to know that you can still jump in with us. When we have these spiritual journeys, then we do it this way. We have a free guide for you that our team has put together. If you don't have one, I'm gonna encourage you to get one. You can download one online. You can get one for free in the commons. And then also a group is part of it. You see, the church for centuries has learned about Jesus and grown and studied in small settings as you get together and you pray for one another. So I can't encourage you enough. Uh, groups are just kicking off. There's groups still open and available. I know we don't like to be late to the party. You're not late. If you wanna be a part of this, it will enhance your entire experience. So come and join us in this seeds journey. I'm gonna ask if you have your Bibles to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. I'm gonna to go to Matthew 13 on the way because Matthew 13, and you can go online and watch the messages are some foundational understanding about seeds where Jesus is giving a meta parable which is truthfully his commentary and understanding of all of these parables so that you can understand where Jesus is coming from. And so we're gonna go look at Matthew 13 for just a moment as we think about seeds. And starting this week, we're gonna start looking at practical areas where seeds come into play into God's truth for us. We've set the foundation over the last few weeks. And this week, we're going to deal with something that by human nature causes us to not receive how God works. See, part of this series is the understanding of who God is and what God does, but it's also our participation in the process. And if we don't understand what God is doing, then it leaves us sometimes a little confused or feeling like we don't know what to do. And I find a lot of people are in that boat. It's like, is this really that confusing? Can you understand what God's up to? How do you participate with God? God, could you give us some insight? And this week we're gonna look at a big one. And that is that we have a propensity in human nature to lean toward the big, the big things, the big blessings, the big opportunities, the big breakthroughs. I saw it several years ago as our soft drinks at the gas station. I stop at the gas station. Sometimes I pick my kids up from school. They're like, Dad, can we stop and get a snack? And when I walk up, there's an option for a little cup or a medium cup. And I always go for that. <laughs> it's, it's this big. I'm like, do we really need that much Diet Coke? Y'all know what I'm saying, all right? It's like, wow. And then now our gas stations are getting bigger if you're not from Texas. Just roll by Bucky's. Come on, somebody. Just roll by there. I mean, there's big drinks and there's big shelves full of stuff and there's big barbecue, you know. My friend said, Hey, we're going out tonight. I said, Where are you going? He said, We're going to Bucky's. I said, Really? Taking your wife to Bucky's? That's awesome, man. That's the way to splurge, man. Y'all going to have dinner and buy a birdhouse. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get decorations. We're going to buy groceries. Come on, man. we're going to do it all right there at Bucky's, you know. We like the big, big personal bathroom, big bank of gas pumps. We like it big. It's just how we're wired. Before COVID, I was on an airplane flying back from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and 
sitting beside a guy who was much smaller in stature than me. He and I began to talk and we started just enjoying our conversation. So I asked him what his name was. He said, my name is Jeffrey. I said, cool, man, that's what my name is. I said, how do you spell it? He said, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. I said, that's good. You know how to spell it right. Because it's not Jeffrey. It's not G-E-O-F, Guffery. You know what I'm saying? It's Jeffrey. Your parents did it right, man. Your name is Jeffrey and you spelled it right. And I said, well, what's your last name? He said, Bigger. My name's Jeffrey Bigger. <laughs> Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey Bigger. I'm Jeffrey Little. And I'm bigger than you. So we are in a problem here. Jeffrey Bigger sitting next to Jeffrey Little, and Jeffrey Bigger's a whole lot smaller than Jeffrey Little. <laughs> We, we like it bigger. Here's what Jesus is going to talk to us about today. Everything in the kingdom starts small. It starts small and we get frustrated with the small because we're so desiring the big. We want the big, we miss the small. And because we don't participate in the small, because we don't understand how God's kingdom works in our lives we tend to dismiss it or get frustrated or get impatient and we stop what God can do if we would value the small. Value the small. Jesus says it in Matthew 13 when he's been giving us all of this teaching on how his teachings work. He says he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, Yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. The birds eat the seeds, but notice this, when the seed gets planted in the right soil, then the seed becomes a tree that the birds can perch in. And so you're like, man, everything's getting eaten up in my life. Well, you got to get the seed off the ground and into the ground. You got to get it into the place where it works and then it starts to grow, not immediately, but then becomes this tree that the birds can perch in. I want to give you the understanding of why Jesus gives a mustard seed because in Matthew 17, he revisits it again. He shows it in a different way and talks about something in the area of small that we need to value. A mustard seed, again, small. Very small, smallest of seeds. It was the smallest thing they could think of. They didn't have uh, microscopes. There was no understanding of microbiology, germs, amoebas. They had no ability. So Jesus is using the smallest thing that they could think of to teach them a big principle in their lives. Mustard, by the way, mustard seed. Mustard is not yellow. It's gray. Yellow is the dye. By the way, how many of y'all are mustard people? How many of you online say I'm a mustard person? How many of you are mayonnaise people? Here's what I've learned. I'm a student of people. People who like mustard only hate mayonnaise. I mean, they despise it. Most people who eat mayonnaise, they will eat mustard too. But mustard people are snooty. They're real snooty. They're real specialized. That's just for free today. I don't know what you'll use that for. That's just for free. Matthew chapter 17, the problem is not conceptual. See, Jesus was preaching in concept. Now it's real life. Jesus has gone up on the Mount of Transfiguration, took a few of his disciples. He's transfigured before them that they see who he is. He has this moment, it's a spiritual moment, and the disciples are like, this is so powerful, can we live here? Can we stay here? We all love the big mountaintop experience when we see God move, when we see God show up, when he opens that door of opportunity, when he changes someone that you love. We all love that moment, and we all say what the disciples say, can we live here? There's only one problem in life. When you have mountaintop experiences, you have to learn what you need to learn because you're going back down the mountain into the valley. And what you receive on the mountaintop, you have to put into practice when you're in the valley. 
And so Jesus takes them back down the mountain, and I don't believe that it's just circumstance, because I don't believe anything is coincidence in the word of God that they immediately run into this situation, the disciples do. When they came to the crowd, there was a man who approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. There's no pain like kid pain. Have mercy on my son. Jesus feels his pain. Jesus sees what's going on. He said he has seizures and he's suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or even into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Now, some of you are thinking that, well, wait a minute. Does that mean the disciples should be able to heal him? This is even, they're in a learning process and even the guy is not, when you hear someone's testimony, they're not necessarily theologians. The disciples can't heal anyone anyway. Milestone Church can't heal anyone. Jeff Little can't heal anyone. Jesus can though. So the better vernacular is, is that they are showing here and Jesus is showing here that the disciples didn't understand the power available in Jesus to do the work. You unbelieving, Jesus gets a little frustrated. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus is a little upset. How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. I don't believe that Jesus is only talking about demon possession and even healing, he's talking about now using it as a teaching moment for a bigger understanding of how he works. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private. I love this. I love it because we get a window into it. It's like, Jesus, tell me why you can do great things, but you want to do great things through me, but I seem to somehow have a block there. I don't know how to participate with what you want to do. Privately, they asked him, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute. I think I have little faith. Read on. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain. Jesus is showing the contrast between the smallest thing they know, they're in Galilee and there's mountains, the contrast between the smallest thing and the largest thing that they can see. What he's really saying is, you have no faith. You have no faith. You have your own ability. You have your own intellect. See, if you don't understand the seed of the person of Jesus Christ that comes in to our lives, to help us in this life, if you don't understand that and how the world works and how powerful the kingdom is, what Jesus is saying is there's so much more power available to you and that's why he gets frustrated. He's like, I've laid this out for you, it's here, but you're not receiving it. If you don't have that, all you're left with, all you're left with is your own intellect, your own ability, maybe somebody you know that does have faith, maybe I could get to the church, maybe I could get to a pastor, maybe I could find somebody on the internet, maybe I could Google something and those people will tell me that life will be okay. You're left with trying to find an answer and Jesus is saying, quit looking, I'm it. Quit searching, I'm it, it's right here, boom compares it to a mountain. And then he says, you can say to this mountain, when you get it, it changes how you talk because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can hear people who understand that their confidence is in Jesus and not in any other thing. You say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Small can create great. Small can make a big difference. Now, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. It's fear. And I'm not specifically speaking even to our current climate related only to COVID-19. I'm speaking to just our world. There's a problem in our world of an overabundance of fear. Fear sells. Fear creates clicks. Fear is something we struggled with before our current environment. And as a pastor in our team, overwhelmed with people, consumed by anxiety, 
consumed by depression. I'm not being critical of you. I'm saying there's an answer, but it'll come in a different way than you think. It's not an external force. It's something really small called the seed of the person of Jesus Christ that creates a different outlook on the world around you. When I talk about fear, I'm not talking about arachnophobia, spiders. I'm afraid of snakes more than spiders. The pelidophobia or one of those, fear of bald people. I'm not afraid of those. <laughs> I'm not talking about fear of the night or the dawn. I'm not talking about small fears. Let's all just be really honest. It, it, don't, don't take it when someone acts like, I'm not afraid. They're scared. They have fears. We all have fears. Well, I'm, not, I'm talking about the real stuff in life. There's a bump. I wonder if I'm going to die of cancer. My aging parents, will they fall and break their hip and I'm not there and I didn't take care of them? My children, can they process a world that has so much influence of darkness? How will they live out their faith because of all that they face today? Can it happen? We all have real fears. I have them too. I just had my third child start driving. She got her driver's license. She drove off this week. I, I, it, it gives me fear. I have to put it before God. You know, I want them just to stay babies and ride with me. And then she pulls into my driveway, you know, like or into my neighborhood. I was leaving and I passed this little car coming up and, and, and I'm like, roll down your window. And she's got her leg up driving and she's got the radio on. I'm like, look, 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 10 and 2. <laughs> look, you're not, you're, you're, you're not at master's level. You're still kindergarten. Both feet on the floor, turn the radio down. Come on, everybody know what I'm saying as a parent. Get <laughs> focus, man. I've had, I've had fears throughout the last year. With all the divisions in our world, can Jesus' church still come together and focus on him as king? Can we still do that? Pastors have had fears. You have fears. I don't know what you're afraid about. Your job, you're getting older, your kids. You're afraid that you may never be married as a single person. What do you do? Do you just let it consume you? I've been passionate about sharing this message with you because there's an answer, but it starts small. It starts small. It's like, would Jesus swoop out of heaven and fix my family and fix my anxieties and fix my situations and fix my kids and fix my spouse? No, 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 no. Start with the small. See, the seed is perfect. The seed of Jesus Christ this seed that produces faith in us is perfect. There's talk about seeds, GMO, genetically modified organisms. I'm not today trying to modify the seed. In fact, this week I thought with a holistic understanding of the Bible, you're like, you're talking about this seed that produces faith. What produces faith? What does that look like? Let me show it to you. How does faith work like a seed? Here's how it works. It starts with, faith doesn't start with, because I think a lot of people believe it's super Christians who are these type of people. It's super Christians who look out at the world with all of its fears and have a different viewpoint. It's, it's like super people. You know, you, Pastor Jeff, you're a pastor, you know, you're, you're just, they, no, 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 it's for everybody. It's for everybody. Let me tell you how it works. Very basic. Don't have to modify the seed. It always starts with not you, but God. It's not an emotion. It's not a, I'm a positive person. It's not willpower. It's like, I will be positive. I will be positive. I will. I feel like not being positive. No, 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 no. It's when you think about God, A.W. Tozer said, that, that very thought influences everything in your life. That God is faithful. He is faithful 36 times. He is described as in the Bible, God is faithful. Deuteronomy 7, 9, know therefore that the Lord your God is God and he is. Everybody say is. He's not trying to be. He is the faithful God. And the truth is he is faithful to us. For those of us who have the seed of Jesus Christ, whatever we face, we still win. We don't want to face bad circumstances, but no matter what we face, we still win. My wife, 
attended a funeral of a young lady who passed away from cancer a couple of weeks ago. She prayed for her at Prepare. She passed away from cancer. My wife shared at the funeral that she went to her bedside and looked in her eyes and told her, you're either gonna be healed or you're gonna be healed. Because we win. We win. He is a faithful God to us. He's ahead of you. He knows your future better than you know your present. He is a faithful God. You will never have faith when you trust more in human beings' ability to fix your problems than you do God. You will never have faith. Faith is, I know my God, and I know his character, and I know his nature, and he can be trusted. The second thing is his word. His word is reliable. I always love to mention this because, again, we think faith and a faith-oriented outlook is, again, these are positive people that have a different perspective and they're just optimistic and they're not melancholic. No, 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 no. They are people of the word. They're people of the word. So you're, you're like, I don't have faith. I'm afraid about this situation. I have fear. But when you have the word, when you have grounding in the word, you understand that the word of God says that we are more than conquerors. The word of God says, I'll be with you over and over. The word of God says, do not be afraid, over and over and over and over. So it says to you, not your feelings. If we spent half as much time listening to the word's opinion about our situation as we do looking at what something online or something around us or somebody else says, the word of God is where you receive faith. You're like, I don't have it, here's good news. So then faith comes. By hearing, we spent the last few weeks talking about, do you have ears to hear? It comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing someone soothe your problems? Hearing someone say, I will fix it? Hearing someone say it's gonna be okay? No, faith comes by hearing the word of God. The word of God. You you gotta get this seed planted. You gotta plant this seed in your kids. You gotta plant this seed in your house. You gotta plant this seed around your life. You've gotta get this around your life because this can be trusted. The word of God. It takes time. Time, it takes longer. I love this verse of scripture right here. It's contrary to American culture. Do not become sluggish, but imitate those who by faith and patience because they started small. Anytime you've seen someone, you're like, I wish I had, you've all been around people like that. When they pray, you're like, God's listening. Anybody know anybody like that? You're like, they're, they're stable and they have a lot of problems and like they've had big breakthroughs and God's done amazing things. Here's what you'll find. It's not because they haven't had big problems. It's through faith and patience they've continued to plant and foster the seed they inherit the promises. I'm committed to this as your pastor, if I'm your pastor. I'm committed to this. Why do I have grow as something we're going to emphasize? Because I learned, thank God for the stability of people who plant seed, who stand on the word of God, who have faith in the fact that the kingdom of God starts small and grows. But I will tell you, pastors across the country are concerned, disappointed. Why? Because let me tell you, a little dab of this thing is not going to do you. You're like, where does that come from? All the old people know the the deal. My grandmother, she had creams. She had creams. If you broke your toe, put some Shackley foot cream on it. If you broke your arm, put some Shackley foot cream on it. If you have a stomach ache, put some Shackley foot cream on it. If you're discouraged, put some Shackley foot cream on it. And my dad at my grandmother's house still had a tube of what he used when he was a kid, Brill cream, a little dab. All the older people know what I'm talking about. Young people are like, I've never heard of that. Brill cream, just a little dab will make your hair look so good that the ladies will want to run their fingers through it. Y'all know what I'm saying? (laughs) A little dab will do you. A little dab starts the process, but a Christmas and Easter faith A little, I'm going to go to church and get a little inspired is not going to carry you through in life. It's not going to overcome your fears. And the testing and the challenges and the problems of the last several months have shown where we put our faith. And as a pastor, I'm always concerned for the one. 
The one that gets off and gets scared. The one that gets off and gets distracted. The one that gets left out. If you're listening to me, I'm praying for you. But I want to tell you this, you're not going to overcome with just a little online message, with a little bit of the word, with a little bit of a service, with a few songs on your radio. You're not going to overcome that way. Faith and patience, you inherit the promises. There's a time process. That's why we make the step simple. It's not hard. 101, 201, 301. That's not hard. It's just hard to commit to. You're like, well, I did it. It didn't work. Do it again. Do it again. Do it, do it as many times as it takes. And it doesn't stop with that. It's a process that tries to get you started reading your own Bible. Then after you've done that, maybe lead someone else. Get with someone else. Get in a kingdom-oriented lifestyle. Get around the word of God. Put it in your home. Say, this is the standard of our house. Hold it up over your head and say, we're submitted to it. Live by it. Walk it out. And guess what will happen? Whoa, that tree starts growing. It takes time, though. I just want Jesus to fix it. Well, he's mad because you don't know how to participate with him to fix it. He's going, wait a minute. <laughs> Guys, I've done a lot of fixing. But I'm upset with you right now because I'm providing for you a way for you to be a part of the solution. Our response, you have to believe and act. You have to believe and act. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There's steps. I want to tell everyone, the Christian life is a step that includes you being afraid that's against your faith one step after another. <sighs> you get saved by grace through faith. Oh, what will my friends say? What will my family say? What if I can't live up to it? You can't. What if I don't? What if I? What if I? What if I? What if I? All of it. And by grace, you say, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. And your dead field now has life. But it takes a step of faith over your fear to get the seed in your field. And then a lot of times we're confused by the fact that now it's growing and we think, well, now it's just going to be one big breakthrough after another. No, 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 no. It's the same process. Oh, okay. Uh, whatever area it is, I want to give you three areas. How do we actually grow in it? You're like, okay, the seed works. How does it work? Here, here's how we grow in our faith. Number one, we understand the big always starts small. When we have big problems, we want big solutions, but Jesus says, here's a seed. I, I've got to, we've, we've preached this so much in the last 20 years. You have a big destiny. You have a big destiny. We have a whole generation going, I'm called to big stuff. I'm a big dreamer. Well, if you have a big destiny, get ready for big problems and you better have some seed growing in your field. You better have some seed growing because if you have a big destiny, there are big giants and big demons facing you. So you better know how this kingdom thing works. The first church I pastored, 21 years old. I had an epiphany this week. First church I pastored, I, I, it was a painful experience. I was a young pastor, just preaching the word. I invited a group of African Americans to our church in this community at this time, 27 years ago. They, 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 they had issues. They, it, it, they got mad about that. And I was just preaching the Bible, trying to reach my community. I started a small group. They're like, we can't do small groups. The only way God speaks to people is through Sunday school. Come on. We get so caught up in our form. I changed the music. Ah! I, I wasn't real suave back then. It was like I threw the choir loft out. That probably wasn't good. But I did not do everything as smooth maybe as possible, but I had kingdom in my heart. I started a small group with four young couples. I ended up ultimately resigning from that church. They gave me a standing ovation. Left. Do a lot for your self-esteem. Big destiny, big problems preaching the Bible, same Bible I'm preaching to you today. Those four couples gathered together with me. I left there with a lot of pain, but here's the redemptive power of the kingdom. We hosted 500 ministry leaders here a couple of weeks ago where pastors and leaders came. I did a Zoom call this week with 61 pastors from around the country because churches and pastors are discouraged. They got to get their eyes back on the kingdom. 
I just put it out there. Didn't even think anyone would show up. 61 pastors came on and said, tell us what to do. Where do we go? In that group of 561 was a young man named Robert Hobson who was in that original small group. He now pastors a church in the same town where I started that small group. I was like, wow, kingdom seed. Every time you plant kingdom seed, you have no idea the fruit of what may happen because God is a redemptive God when we're kingdom focused. Yeah, powerful story. I was like, wow, wow. Number two, we expect to get more of what we water. People that are faith-oriented water faith seeds. In other words, they're not counting on something else, so they keep watering this kingdom seed. They keep building an environment of that. They're, they're forward-focused. They're faith-oriented. Their God is at work. They know the kingdom seed is working. Faith people move toward the promises. They're not just trying to survive. They're trying to move toward kingdom establishment in their lives. They trust God. There's a German study about 50 years ago called the forgetting curve. I want you to get this because I'm talking about how faith works. The forgetting curve, and it's this. The study has been proven, that's why it's still around. The forgetting curve says this, that if you receive truth, you receive information, you receive something that you could put into practice, but you don't put it into practice, after six days you lose it. After six days, you lose it. So you can come to church and listen to a great message, but if you don't put it into practice in your life, you lose the very revelation of what you're hearing from the Bible. You have to water it. You have to create an atmosphere for it to grow along the way. Here's the third thing. We realize faith grows in the right environment. There's an environment there. Jesus walked into a city and he said, I, I can't really do much here with you guys because you don't have an atmosphere here. It's not conducive. See, see, faith is contagious. Faith is contagious in your home. It's contagious with your friends. Now, the devil will never tell you that. He'll tell you, oh, you're on the outside. No one's listening. Your friend's never going to change. Your child's never going to change because he wants to stop you from planting the seed. Because if the seed gets in the ground, it's contagious. If you build an atmosphere around your business, around your home, around your life that says we're trusting God, God is faithful, honest. Some people think, is this like naive, like you just act like there's not problems? No, no, no. There's a place to talk about the situation. We're not talking about being fake. How are you doing? Blessed. We're fine. Okay, please. Okay, it's okay to say, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what's going on. But then you build an atmosphere that says, I don't know exactly what God's up to, but we're going to trust him. We're going to lean on him and we're going to lean on one another. And you need someone in your life to go, you, I hope you have faith oriented people around your life to go, you know what? You're too absorbed with too much criticism. Everything out of your mouth is negative and critical and against and negative. And, and, and it's like, if I get around you, it's like, I'm hopeless. I, I feel hopeless. Look, we're not hopeless because we have the kingdom seed growing in us. So when you build that, you need that type of atmosphere. I'm not saying you can't witness to and spend time and try to reach out to people who are faithless, but you better have some anchors around your life that are faith oriented, that says God is still on his throne and God's still moving and he's still changing things because that's an atmosphere. And let me bring it right down to home. The number one desire of parents is to transfer their faith to their children. Number one desire. Let's make sure we're living toward that. Let's make sure we're actually doing that. If they see us, all oh, like it's all blah, 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 blah. they're like, well, where's God? If they see us overly absorbed with other stuff around us and not putting that kingdom seed, then we can't transfer to them what we want them to do in their home when they have their own home. We, we want to start transferring that. By the way, divine inheritance is not the money, possessions, and things that you give to your kids in your last will and testament. Divine inheritance is they love the God you love and trust him with every decision and live under the authority of his word. That's divine inheritance. So we should be transferring that in the way we live. 
You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. So you better be tilling up that part of your life. You, you need to, I, I, again, nothing wrong with pursuing career goals. Nothing wrong with having some fun. Nothing wrong with leisure. Nothing wrong with any of that. All I'm saying is none of that is what you're really going to care about. Young families, listen to me right now as your pastor. You're not going to care if you kept up with the Joneses. You're going to care if your kids love the God that you love. So sow that seed. Sow that seed. A friend of mine said, well, we're talking about getting a lake house. Younger, younger dad. Talking to him this week. He said, I just don't know. He was just, we were just talking about it. Younger family. He said, well, I like a lake house. We like the lake. But, you know, I'm sensing that God's saying maybe we shouldn't get a lake house right now because our kids are young. Because if we get it, we'll be at it every weekend because we paid for it and we're having to maintain it, so we got to be there every weekend. I don't know if that's good for the season of time because I don't want my kids just to be good jet skiers and know how to ski slalom. I want them to love the God that I love. I said, you know what? You're on track. Now, when you get them out of the house, buy one and I'll borrow it. Am I saying it's wrong to have a lake house? What I am saying is we've witnessed this last year a group of people that have sowed seeds to everything in their life except that which can carry them through the storm and that which you can actually transfer. Sow the kingdom seed. Sow the faith seed. Sow the Jesus seed. And it says, I don't even know how to comprehend that. You can say to that mountain, be thou removed and it'll be cast into the sea. I got a testimony from a gentleman this week. He sent this in to me this week. I want to read what he said. Jeff, I want to share with you several reasons why Milestone has changed and saved me. I'm really thankful for the testimony, and I'm not trying to be corrective, kind of, but Milestone hasn't changed you and saved you. The Jesus we love has changed and saved you. But I really like your testimony. As a veteran of the U.S. Army, I was proud to serve something bigger than myself. To protect and defend this nation was truly an honor. But since 1989, when I resigned my commission and joined the private sector, I lost my way and my sense of purpose. I only measured my life by my income. Just the last several years, my PTS has gotten worse. Remember last week, Matthew 13? The deceitfulness of wealth. Wealth is a great tool, but it lies. It lies. Three years ago, my wife and I were brought to Milestone by our granddaughter, Kingdom Seed. Up until then, I'd moved away from churches because they left me with more uncertainty than answers. That was until you, sir. Yes, you showed, my, showed me God's love for me in a church that could bring me back to his house. During this time, not only did I feel God's grace, but I believe a calling and a purpose for my life. In service today, this was last week, as you spoke about money not filling my soul, I could definitely say, Amen. And I am a testament to that very fact. And this is my favorite part of his entire testimony. And I'm working on the soil that I pray grows the seed. Now, let me encourage you. You keep working on the soil. You don't have to pray for the seed. It can do it itself. The seed will work. Okay. Keep praying. Keep working on the soil. Keep positioning yourself to receive. And if the seed of Jesus Christ in his kingdom gets in the soil of your heart, it will grow. It will grow. And the hard part is it starts off small and we like big. Value the small. Value the power of a small breakthrough. A small breakthrough with your child. A small breakthrough in your finances. A small one week of sowing the seeds of his word that turns into another week, that turns into a month, that turns into a year of being around the kingdom and growing. Value that and over time you'll look up and that tree is a whole lot bigger than you ever thought it could be. Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray right now for any person who doesn't know you, that has no faith because they don't know you, Jesus. I pray right now, if that's you, you just simply say, Jesus, here I am. Come into my life. Save me. Become my Lord. Become my Savior. 
I believe you died for me. You rose from the dead. Come into my life. Every week we have people pray that prayer with me. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're here in the service. If you prayed that prayer now, by God's grace and your willingness to trust him, he comes to live inside of you. And our prayer is that you would grow in it. So you've let us know if you're online or in the service, let us know so we can help you start growing in that relationship. Second of all, Lord, I pray for every person. How fear tries to overtake our lives, how distraction, how by human nature, we wanna look to an outside source other than you. We want the big, we want the big breakthrough, we want the big provision from you. But Jesus, we hear your words today. We are your disciples. We hear you privately telling us to just plant that seed in our hearts and grow that seed and that faith over time will begin to grow and develop. Lord, I pray for every person listening to me facing impossible situations, as hard as it is, as counterintuitive as it is, I pray they'd go back to that simple seed. In Jesus' name, amen.